Hey everybody, this is Mike, and this is going to be part two of hijacking reality. And uh, this is one of my uh, my personal favorite topics, and because it's going to be about the Susquehanna River and um, the magic altar, which um, it 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 became. You know, there's uh, I'm going to go over this 400 year magic working which was done upon this river and you know what I'm saying right now might sound a little bit you know, what are you talking about but hopefully by the end of this presentation it's going to make sense but even more so is how it ties into what we talked about in the first um, in the first part which is the age of Aquarius and a particular expression of what it would be and so we kind of focused on what's going on right now, like all of the, the quarantine and the, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, I saw, uh, uh, on a side note, I saw a, um, a video in, on Truthstream Media uh, that just came out last night, and it was looking at um, the, the uh, behaviors of what is being encouraged or or thrusted upon the population and how it is um, really matches up to an initiation ritual like the standard protocol if you will of an initiation ritual and um, you know that that idea like very much ties in um, to, you know all the stuff which I like to talk about and what we're going to see right now is one level, like maybe deeper. We're looking at a 400 year period as opposed to a smaller period. Um, but it's all about this like ritual and, and you know, what we call magic and, and, and influencing life on a deeper level, not necessarily the deepest level, but you know, um, we're going to see maybe how you know, I want to say like, you know, this is the, the ultimate story, but it is the ultimate storyline for what we are experiencing collectively right now. And hopefully by the time I get to the third piece of hijacking reality, where I talk a little bit more about, um, you know, solutions isn't necessarily the right word, but, you know, looking at it, you know, the, the first two are, are parts are going to be laying the groundwork and then the third part is going to be like okay here are some things um you know which i am doing or, or or what i think makes sense which could be beneficial but anyway so let's get started with this so pulling back the curtain on the biggest mystery you you never knew existed and and this slide actually or this title slide is is specifically about what's going on not only about on the susquehanna river but the susquehanna river in itself so um but before we get there let's lay some groundwork let's do some um let's do some definitions so the first part's called altars first fruits and river worship and so this is just to provide a context um you know, again, using Wikipedia. Wikipedia, in my opinion, is an amazing first level um, uh, research tool, but specifically um, when it comes to like mainstream ideas. You know, this is what is sanctioned to um, to to be told. So you know, you always or that's allowed to be told. So you know, take that in, in in a grain of salt when you do your research with Wikipedia. But then also, like you know, it's it's for more. Um, mainstream sort of issues if you kind of know what to look for you're gonna find a lot of good stuff so we're gonna go to like what is an altar so an altar literally is a structure upon which offerings such as sacrifices are made for religious purposes um, and we go back to the Bible um, regardless of personal opinion of the Bible of like you know what you think it is or what you think it is and you know I don't know but what is undeniable is the fact that the Bible has played an enormous amount of influence on collective culture. And then it's also significant in one way or another um, within uh, to the uh, um, to the system which we find ourselves within. I mean, just proof is like, you know, the president puts his hand on the Bible. Uh, when you go in and, and, you know, you swear an oath, that's that's the symbol of what you're swearing your oath onto, or at least that's how it, it, it's done um, 
you know, here in, in the United States. So, okay, so we go back to the Bible, and we see right here, it says, in the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament, um, I'm, I'm assuming they're referring to, it's typically made of earth or unwrought stone. <clears throat> if you take that one, one step further, what it's saying is uh, the altar is earth, and so the greatest altar is going to be the earth itself or, or, or large parts of the earth. Then it says, altars are generally erected in conspicuous places. That's going to be important also. So this just means like it's meant to be seen, you know, it's not meant to necessarily be hidden. But the altar, which we're going to talk about, is, um, is very much hidden in plain sight, but it is in the most conspicuous locations. Um, so now we want to go on to this idea of first fruits. And let me see where I can move this picture. So... I guess I'm just going to be out of it for a little bit. So first fruits, um, like the the literal definition goes back to um, the first agricultural uh, produce of a season of the harvest was offered to like the priest class or like the, the churches. And so like we think about first fruits literally being um, like, like produce, but first fruits are... Um, are you know if you go back it's it's it, it also refers to um you know animals and people the first the first is what's important and what what, what the the idea the logic behind it is you are giving your first to your deity to whoever it is um you are um you are uh you know paying homage to asking for something i don't know like whatever the motivation would be but um i can do this there, I'm back. Um, so, so the first fruits are the, the the truest and the original first fruits and the most significant. Uh, you know, is is you know the, the the firstborn. You know, you see that in like all the 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 Moloch sort of stuff of the 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 Phoenician Canaanites and then the you know Abraham was gonna sacrifice his first son and you know you see him pass over like the plagues the first son so firsts are always important um, I'm going in a little bit about the humanity I'm not gonna go to uh, that's not so much what this is about but but the idea of firsts and what the first is is the first fruit is offered upon the altar so this is how they're connected now I want to add in, um, you know, just again, just more precedence, and it's and this is slightly different, but you know, not really so much if you think about it. Uh, but it's the idea of river worship, um, and we see this in, I mean, realistically, in in every culture across the globe, practiced differently, but like there's some understanding about uh, um, a river be having some sort of transcendental quality some sort of connection to something greater than just like the physical experience and so here are just a couple examples i think these are two very strong examples um you know the 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 celts and so um you know this is from this book from 1911 uh Chapter 12 on River and Well Worship. I'll just read a little bit. Among the Celts, the testimony of contemporary witnesses, inscriptions, votive offerings, and survivals show the importance of the cult of waters and water divinity. Uh, Mr. Gohm argues that Celt water worship was derived from the pre-Celtic Aborigines. So it's it's going back before the Celtic culture. And so Celtic culture spread is is much further than just the the British Isles. Like it was practiced throughout the mainland of Europe as well. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, uh, picking up on here, but if so, the Celts must have had a peculiar aptitude for it, since they were so enthusiastic in its observances. What probably happened was that the Celts already were, were worshippers of the waters, free, freely adapted, adopted the local cults. Okay, well, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, well, the bottom line is, uh, particularly within the Celtic um, tradition, and we're going to go into this a little bit deeper, is that there is a direct correlation between a particular waterway, a particular river, a particular well, and a particular deity. 
Um, and the same sort of concept we've seen without the vet throughout the Vedic culture, and we still see a little bit of it as it as it relates to river worship, goddess worship um, in India. And you know, there's there's quite a bit of evidence that suggests that you know the Celt the Celtic uh, culture and the Vedic culture are um, either come from the same mother culture or maybe the Celtic is even a byproduct or, or, or the child of, of the Vedic. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the similarities in a lot of their practices. But, you know, again, I just want to show that there's this, 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 this precedent, and particularly within high cultures, um, you know, really the Vedic culture is very sophisticated in certain ways. Um, uh, but river worship at was was common practice and common knowledge so you know where am i going with all this i'm going with the fact that the susquehanna river is and this 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 magic altar which i'm referring to it as is an ancient practice um i often refer to this also as the susquehanna mystery because at least to me part of the mystery is like you know how much of this which i'm going to go and cover was done consciously and how much of it was done on a, on a um on a deeper level like you know there's almost i imagine it like a, a magnetism that was set in place which certain things occurred within on this 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 body of water you know that i don't know um but that's almost less significant than the fact that you know it's happened you know what we're going to see is 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 um you know i'm assuming it's accurate but accurate historical fact so um let's go into the susquehanna river so most people don't know what the susquehanna river is unless you live in new york state in pennsylvania or maryland and and i grew up in maryland and i crossed over like 95 goes right over here this is where 95 goes and i've crossed over this the susquehanna river hundreds of times never knew anything about it didn't even wouldn't even remember the name of it until about five years ago when um you know i found myself living right where this arrow was pointing but nonetheless so this is the general shape of the susquehanna river it um it begins right here in cooperstown new york um we're going to go and talk about this a little bit later but you know it is right by the baseball hall of fame you know it goes all the way down here uh mormonism founded right here if you know your mormon uh history uh joseph smith was baptized by john the baptist this is where it happened you know just like you know the the significance of the nile with 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 moses you know it's so we go down here um there are two main branches this is the north branch this is the west branch then you've got what's called the lower susquehanna there are not any major cities on this on this um on this river uh, for a variety of reasons, like practically speaking, it's a very, very shallow river. And so that's one of the reasons you couldn't do like major transportation or ship transportation upon it. Um, you know, another reason, you know, whether this was done purposefully or not, it allows this river to remain unknown because not that many people live here. Right here is um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, the capital of Pennsylvania, the capital of the Keystone State. So if you want to go into your Masonic symbology, like, you know, keystone is pretty important within the, the art form of stone masonry and to have a keystone state, it tells you something, particularly when the state was also the holy experiment. Um, you know, the, there's some, some clues written right there about the significance of this area. And then the capital of the keystone is, you know, is probably the biggest city on this river. Uh, capital of the keystone state is the biggest city on this river. And I don't know how big it is, maybe like, 150,000 like it's not a particularly big city and then you could see like the river ends right here but if you're really paying attention you'll see like well it doesn't really end it just changes it just changes its expression and it's going to become a little bit more clear when we look at this this is a satellite image and you can see right here this is the river which we're talking about and then all of a sudden you can see that it changes into this now this has a different name this has a different name, so it it is seemingly to most people that this is a different body of water than this, and it's certainly a different expression, but this is the same body of water. And if you could really kind of, um, you know, use your imagination a little bit, you could see how this is just kind of following the same path. Um, so where are we right now? So this is called the Chesapeake Bay. You know, most people are probably familiar with that. 
This right here is the Potomac River. The Potomac River is a tributary of the Susquehanna River. I'm going to go and show you that this is actually the Susquehanna River. Um, uh, right here is Baltimore. Right here is Philadelphia. So this is, um, what is this? The Delaware River and this is the Delaware Bay. They're almost kind of like twins. Um, and you could see these lights right here if you're paying attention, if you could see that high clarity, uh, high enough clarity on your screen. But these are, you know, the cities and, you know, this is 95. I told you 95, the 95 corridor. Um, this is where it runs over. So this is the Susquehanna River. Um, and um, we're, we're talking about it as, a, as an altar. And so when I'm saying it's an altar, I'm referring to the entire body, and I'm referring to this as one, um, one entity, one uh, um, unified um, unit, if you will. It's like, you know, your legs are different than your torso, but it's all one body. So this is all the same body, and it includes... Uh, this branch, it includes this lower portion, and includes this estuary known as the Chesapeake Bay. And the main, the main transitions or the main, uh, the key points I want to bring to fruit, uh, bring to your attention. I'm going to talk about them a lot. Are the endpoints or the source locations, the confluence of the major branches the transition from river to estuary and then the transition from from um estuary into ocean uh we talked about or it said before like altars are um built of the earth and in conspicuous places conspicuous means obvious and so these are the most obvious places right here where these transitions occur you know there's it's it's more specific than saying like where the big bend happens right here like yeah you can you can identify that but this is this is these places are are more conspicuous more more uh noticeable and this is where we're going to see the first fruits um a couple of other things which I just want to point out before we go deeper is uh, one, if you're familiar with Goro Adachi's work, and you know he's one of the the godfathers of of this this synchro mysticism. Um, so if you're not familiar with him, definitely you know familiarize yourself uh, with his stuff because you know he he has such a fantastic um, perspective. But anyway, so he wrote a book called, um, I think it's called Time River Theory, maybe. And he analyzes, I think it's the Nile, maybe the Amazon as well. But he looks at it from the whole. He looks at it from this big picture sort of perspective. And, you know, me being a, a fan of Goro, like obviously like his work has influenced upon my thinking and my understanding. And so a lot of this ability to, to see this river from this... Uh, a larger uh, perspective, it, it comes from Goro's influence. So, you know, that's the first thing. And the second thing, if you want to think about it also, um, particularly as it relates to like um, uh, primordial forms, you know, uh, maybe biomimicry is another word, like the, the reason why there are certain foods that resemble certain parts of the body, the most obvious being like the heart and a tomato, you know, the similarity between the two. And then how those, those foods um, also are very healthy for the body part that it looks like, whether that's celery for bones or, you know, tomatoes for heart and so forth. So, you know, that there is this certain, that's what I mean by like this underlying sort of um, fundamental um, uh, forms that we see in the physical universe. And, you know, this looks like, in a symbolic way, the female reproductive system. You know, we've got like, you know, if you can imagine, this is the, the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, and, and, you know, this is where birth happens. And so this is, on a certain way, a very, very, um, you know, just from, from the shape, you could think about it uh, as a birth canal. And, you know, if you're familiar with, with uh, Jordan Maxwell's work, you know, he really introduced into all of our minds, like, you know, rivers and banks and currency and current and, you know, all of this sort of stuff and why everything is grounded on rivers. What's the biggest, what's the biggest uh, company right now? Um, Amazon, you know, it's tapping into rivers. Rivers are, you know, part of the mystery. I don't even know what a river is. Like we can describe it from our very, very... Um, 
material sense and we could analyze it, you know, transportation and, and life force, but, or like life supporting biodiversity. But, um, and I'll get into this more in the third part, but like, you know, being open to the idea that rivers are a whole lot more uh, than what we think they are, the ancients point to that, and then also like there's a connectivity in ways which which are often unappreciated. How how much you know this I, this you know what's called sympathetic magic? It, it it's effective. So okay, so um, this is our river altar. And what we're going to see is at each of these main points are the first fruits of very, very major um, industries or, or ideas or, um, or, or just, you know, uh, aspects of our modern life. This is where it began. So as we learn from the ancients, as we learn from like, you know, this is what I'm sacrificing to my God. This is what I, this is, I'm putting it on the altar. And what do I put on the altar? I put on the first fruits. So the fact that we're going to see right here, right here, and right here, the birthplace of um, distributed electricity, the computer technology industry, and globalism. And if you remember anything from part one, those are all major archetypes which fit underneath the Aquarius model. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more detailed later, but that's where we're going with this is the first fruits of these particular expressions are on this river. <laughs> I realize I mean, I'm getting a hold of myself because I haven't even gotten into like why this river is special, but this is where we're going to go. We're going to see that it was put on this river. And so I indicated, you know, a couple things right now uh, in the beginning. I'm like, you know, no one knows this river. There's no, there's no, even though it's like right by the largest population centers on the earth from Washington, D.C. right here up to Boston, which is right about here. You know, you've got more people living in a smaller space than anywhere else on earth. And I guarantee 85% of these people, if you go and you, you, you ask all these folks, like, where's the Susquehanna River? You're going to get a what? You know, so we know it's hidden in plain sight. And, you know, I talked a little bit about maybe I'm stretching my imagination, but maybe at the end you're not going to think I'm stretching so much. Like, yeah, that kind of looks like the female reproductive system. But now I'm going to give you some, like, really, like, um, more tangible facts for why this river is so um, unique and special. So the first thing is, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, that the river and the Chesapeake Bay are the same. And there's one thing about me saying like it's the same, but no, this is just like this is this is geological fact. The ancient Susquehanna River still exists today as troughs that form a deep channel along much of the bay's bottom. It's talking about the Chesapeake Bay here. The Chesapeake Bay assumed its present shape about 3,000 years ago. And it's saying like you can see the Susquehanna River uh, makes a channel on the bottom here because this was a flooded, this is known as a rhea. It's the flooded lower valley of a river. And when the Atlantic Ocean, or at least this is the this is how it's explained in 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 mainstream geology about 12,000 years ago the atlantic ocean rose significantly and you know this bay and this bay here were formed and so this was used to be just like the continuation of the river and then it was filled up and this became the chesapeake bay and so i talked about this being a symbol of of birth but it is definitely a symbol of life you know, the Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the United States and is one of the most productive bodies of water in the world. And so by productive bodies, it means like the amount of life which it supports and produces. It is a literal um, living example of life, of biodiversity. You know, a, an estuary is probably second only to a rainforest in terms of the amount of biodiversity. And just because of the uh, the temperate climate of where we are within the Chesapeake Bay, like it's like it just it teems with life. So you know that's kind of special. We got this river, and we got this 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 you know this this huge uh, uh, example of 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 physical of a physical life um, 
a symbol of biodiversity on earth like this area this river is it like in terms of like yeah that's what that's what what life would look like in terms of like i want to look of a symbol as it relates to a river so as it said right here, it says the remnants of the ancient Susquehanna River. And you don't hear that often, like when, when, when you're reading maybe something about like the, the Amazon or something about the Nile or the Mississippi or the Col maybe the Colorado, but, but you don't necessarily hear the word ancient tied into its description. And so the reason why is here we can see this is a list of, it says some of the world's oldest rivers. Um, the sum really comes further down the list because we're going to start with the oldest ones here. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five rivers that are estimated to be, um, or, or, uh, that they can be 300 million years old um or older now again there's like you know it's 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 kind of hard to to really like give a grounding of like this is we can we can we can settle that this is true um whenever we're taking something from um official sources because everything with official sources it should be under question so you know i'm gonna admit that but um you know maybe this is all just made up stuff i don't know but this is the best which we've got right now um, but this is the list of rivers of the estimated age. And then the second thing is like, how do you estimate a river's age? You know, it's not like <coughs> you could, you can do, you can cut it in half and count the rings. But as it relates to the Susquehanna, which is on this list, um, it's because it flows through the, the Appalachian Mountains. And the Appalachian Mountains are recognized to be one of the oldest mountain chains on the on the planet and the reason why that's known or said is because they're so rounded and flat the higher the pointier the mountain the younger it is uh or the yeah the younger it is so the the rounder the flatter the mountain the older it is and then so if you've got a river that runs through it because water takes the path of least resistance, you know that it predates the forming of the mountains. That fossils, all sorts of other stuff like that, that has come to the, um, the analysis to, to reach the conclusion about the Susquehanna's age. These two rivers, this one's in Australia, this one's in France, and then you have these two other ones, the New River and the French Broad. If you ask me, and I'm not gonna go into it now, all of these names are incredibly synchronistic, but these three rivers all found on the East Coast, the New River, the Susquehanna, and the French Broad, um, they're all formed right around the same time. And I almost look at them in terms of like the three sisters, you know, we could go down into like some sort of mythological explanation, but holding on to this, this, this idea that rivers have a significance, um, which can be told in mythological format. Um, you know, I'm kind of playing with that when I say the three sisters, but of the three sisters, there should be markers of the, like, you know, the, the grandest of them all. And so the first one, which, um, I pointed out was, you know this Chesapeake Bay aspect um, you know that it has this very very unique aspect to it in its physicality and you're not going to find anything unique like that with any of these other rivers that are very very old and so um, you know why does old matter and um, symbolically if you found out that the person who lived next door to you was the oldest living person on the earth you know that doesn't necessarily change anything but you're gonna be like something's different about them you know there's there's some sort of like respect something which you're like wow there's something unique and there's an honor which you're going to show to it and so just in that that perspective like you know there's something inherently unique of being the oldest if you will and then if you want to look at it from an evolutionary way you know um like within the body we can look at the what's said to be the oldest parts of the body oldest parts of the brain what's formed first in the development of the human being when it's inside of of the mother or or you know the, the 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 oldest organs if you want to look at it evol 
excuse me, evolutionary, um, you know, the significance because the oldest always influences what comes after that. And, you know, the same is true with, with traditional culture where like the, the elders are treated with respect. And the, there's one reason why you treat them with respect. It's because they've seen more than you. Like there's something kind of inherent that we recognize that there's something, there's something significant about like being the oldest. So without going too deep into that, we're gonna be like, all right, rivers are important. And the oldest one, you know, I don't know why, but I'm going to, I'm going to recognize that it's kind of significant. So now here's a, there, here's another marker, which makes the Susquehanna river objectively different and unique in terms of, um, it's physical. So it's, it's, it's conspicuous, it's undeniable, unique qualities. And so here we're looking at a list of the largest craters on the earth. Um, and these are all craters that are, um, 20 kilometers or more uh, in diameter and older than 10 million years. Um, and so we have this list and we have probably, you know, 15 down, we have this crater in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, diameter of 40 kilometers and um, estimated to be about 35 million years old. And so where do we find that? Where is this Chesapeake Bay impact crater? It's right here, right at the mouth. Um, you know, truth be told, the river is, you know, is said to have moved plenty over its 200 or 300 million year life, like, you know, where it met the, the Atlantic um, or the ocean. But at least now uh, we know that these two line up. So there's this uniqueness, uh, physical uniqueness. We've got like this, this incredible, um, undeniable symbol of, of life. We've got this age. We've got a mark from the heavens with this very, very large crater. I don't have it right here. Uh, I kind of hint to it right here on the, on the big picture, you know, right here, you can see the explosion from the crater. You can see these crystals right here. And that is symbolic. If you know, you're into crystals, you know, you're into, uh, uh, minerals, you're probably familiar with her Herkimer diamond. The Herkimer diamond is a very, very unique and rare form of quartz. What's rare about it is it's double terminated. It's got points on two ends and it's got this water clarity, uh, there aren't really any other quartz crystals which grow everywhere on the planet that are like this. And we find them in Herkimer, New York, which is, I don't know, about like 15 miles away from um, where the source of this river is. So 15 miles is like, you know, on a grand scale of earth, that's like a friggin' bullseye. And if you want to go back in time, you know, back when these mountains were bigger, you know, maybe they were even closer, who knows? But regardless, we've got this, this river, which is marked. It's marked by being very, very special geologically, if you know what to look for. The source of it has the most unique, beautiful crystals you're ever going to see. Um, you've got this age, we've got this estuary, we've got this shape of, of birth. This is part of why I believe that this is why the, the, the altar was done here is because it is the symbol of, if you want to manifest something, this is where you're going to build your altar and your first fruits. And it's also been marked by the heavens with this impact crater. So, uh, da, da, da. um, you know, I kind of, I hinted at this earlier, uh, which was the first fruits which were offered on this river. So the Susquehanna River as an altar. Um, on this image, we could see where major historic events um, have occurred. I'm only going to focus on a few of them, but you're also going to see right here, they all happen at, as I said, we're going to focus primarily on these uh, major transitional points, but you also see at the big bends, other things have occurred. Like this one here, we see that, uh, you know, this is Williamsport. This is the founding of Little League Baseball. This is where Mormonism was established, or, or at least Joseph Smith was baptized into um, the Arianic priesthood, I believe is, 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 is how the, this, the, the, the story goes. Um, and this is what we're going to focus on. We're also going to go look at what's happening at these points A, B, and E, because there is an ongoing infusion of energy. You know, if you're watching this channel, then the idea of like occult, esoteric occult rituals happening in non-secular activities, you know, the Grammys, the, the MTV Awards, the Olympics, you know, that should be, you should know that that exists. And so 
we're, I'm going to show you how this is happening on this river. Um, again, this is where I'm saying, like, I don't know if this is done on purposefully, but I'm going to show it in a pretty fantastic fashion. Um, so, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, we're going to talk about, as I said before, the first, the first distribution of three wire electricity. So positive, negative, and neutral. That happened on this river. It happened right here. You see these three wires? Duh, duh, duh. You know, this where the three wires, the first positive, negative, neutral. You know, your Kabbalah, your left hand path, your right hand path, and your middle path. Your your neutral, your 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 negative and your positive. You have them all right here. Sympathetic magic. So that happens there. We have um the first general electronic, uh, the first electronic general purpose computer, ENIAC. Where is that found? That's found at D, right here. And then we're going to see right here, the birthplace of the British Empire and the United States, which I'm going to say is the birthplace of globalism. You know, we'll get into that in a little bit more, what I mean when we come to that slide. But we find that at point E right here. And, you know, we talked about before, the age of Aquarius. And so this is, again, Wikipedia, very simplistic definition, but they're listing these are the, the, the archetypes, the qualities associated with Aquarius and the age of Aquarius. So the first thing they say is electricity. You know, it's a little bit of a, of a, a jump. Like the truth of it is it's, it's lightning. Lightning is the symbol. And you can see how it's very easy from, from where we go from lightning to, to electricity. Uh, we can thank uh, Rosicrucian High Priest uh, Ben Franklin, who we're going to mention again. But, you know, he's the guy who we, we, we give credit to that electricity and kites and lightning, and he did that in Pennsylvania. And all, so electricity, and here's our first fruit for electricity computers that's not true about about or that's not that's not universally true about the aquarius archetype innovation is is what's true about aquarius now computers are a type of innovation but uh, computers are tied now and it's understandably so and it is an accurate description of of um innovation computers are but we now are linking computers with aquarius and where's the first general computer the first fruit same river just down river look right here this is where we go and we have our first electrical for um wiring first fruit this is where we have our first computer and then we also have humanity humanitarianism so the Aquarius is very, very a human, a human uh, archetype. And by human, it's not just like, uh, like you as an individual human. It's more so like the human family. This is why we think of it as the group. And this is why globalism is an expression. Globalism is, is, is Aquarius, no doubt. I'm not saying it's a it's a healthy expression of of humanitarianism or of Aquarius, but it is certainly about humanity in the group. And by globalism, I'm referring to like you know one culture, monoculture, mono language, mono this, you know, mono currency. And this is all as we talked about before. These are Saturnian expressions of Aquarius. We can see there's a little bit, particularly like the real positive golden age humanitarianism. That's the Uranus expression of Aquarius. Uh, Saturn, I'm going to say, uh, you know, some of the other stuff you can kind of go and, 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 and say like, maybe this is more Saturnian or Uranus, you know, it's, 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 I, we, we can spend some time looking at that, but, but that's not necessarily uh, what we're going to do at this given point. So let's go in a little bit deeper about these, and I'm going to show you some, some, some detail, the first fruit of globalism. So right here, Jamestown Settlement. This is where the Jamestown Settlement is. It's right, it's actually right here. So it's like the guys, they came right here, blah, blah, blah. They settled, and they said, um, we're not going to be able to, to put our colony here, so let's just move a little bit further inland, and then this is Jamestown, Colonial Williamsburg. Um, watch the secret on the Susquehanna. That's when I go into this in great, great detail. But this is where Jamestown is. 
Jamestown was the first permanent col the first permanent English settlement of in the Americas. So the English settlement system is what became the 13 colonies, which became the thir the 13 states, which became the United States. This is where the United States began. But Jamestown is also where the British Empire began. That comes from this guy, William Kelso, who's like, you know, uh, uh, in the world of, of, um, of not anthropology, archaeology and archaeology, like he's a big name. He was actually the, the head um, archaeologist of Williamsburg. He was uh, uh, knighted or, 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 or was... Um, uh, inducted into a very, very um, prestigious uh, um, uh, a, a academy, not academy, like order. He was, he was, he was brought into a prestigious order of the British government. You know, he got there's pictures of him getting his pin from Queen Elizabeth. And the reason I'm bringing that out, so when this guy says like this is where the British Empire began, and like Queen Elizabeth is like, yep, you know, I'm I'm agreeing with this guy, and it's this is the first like permanent colony within the 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 British Empire. I mean, the British Empire became like the 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 largest empire in our recorded mainstream history. You know, I'm not saying empires are good. I'm just saying a lot of people try to build empires and these guys did it better than anyone else. Um, so that in itself is like pay attention and we're still arguably like well underneath that influence and and throughout this British Empire, which really was said to have, have come to its close at the what the end of World War II, I believe. And there was this overlap sometime, like maybe British in, in, in America, maybe Germany, I don't know. Like I mean, I'm not a historian or whatever, but but um regardless, like the British Empire, and, and this slide just talks about, you know, this globalism is a byproduct of this British empire. And what the British empire uh, did was it created this colony system across earth. And it is through this, this network of the colony system that is allowing like um, globalism, uh, all of the companies, all of the organizations, the UN, the, the, the Council on Foreign Relations, you know, we, we see it all kind of connects back to the United States or, or British Empire companies associated with it primarily. And it is through this infrastructure that the globalism, the McDonald's, the targets, the, 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 um, this is where it began. And, this is where it began. So this is why I say that globalism or, or the, the British Empire is um, the birthplace or the symbol of globalism and its birthplace, both it and America, are at the Jamestown Colony. Um, we're going to go a little bit deeper into this, but this whole topic about Jamestown, this is what the secret in the Susquehanna is about. Like, and if you're familiar with like Pocahontas, Poca the, the, particularly the Disney adaptation, because, you know, if you're watching this, you know about like Disney and that, um, you want to pay attention to their telling of history because they're always like wink, wink, nod, nodding at like, you know, what really matters. And so Pocahontas, John Smith, that's a major, major part of the story, um, Frozen 2, you know, maybe I'll do a whole talk just on this. Frozen 2, when they talk about the Mystic River, you know, there's enough evidence. I'm going to suggest that it is talking about this river, but that's another, another video. So, okay, let's move on. The first fruit of the information age. So where do I get that? So I'm going to go and I'm going to use this historical marker. Like, you know, there are lots of, uh, uh, you know, enigma. What the, what, 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 what was it? Was that the tur was Turing and out in Britain during, um, World War Two, and they broke the they broke the Nazis' codes. Is that the first computer? You know what what we're defining computers are general and programmable. And then I'm I'm going to solidify it with this fancy sign. Like they put in a sign. You know it's it's got some weight. But there's a truth to that, particularly when we're looking at a synchromistic perspective, because things like this add weight. Um, and we see right here it's the birth of the information age, and it's the first computer. It's called ENIAC. Um, Sounds a lot like ENOC, and we're going to get to that in a little bit, but ENIAC uh, is an acronym for the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. Uh, definitely watch the 100-year transition from first computer to singularity, to the technological singularity. Like, there's so much, so much rich, um, uh, tangible evidence that points 
to this current from the very beginning to like where we're going. But anyway, so this is where it began with this ENIAC. Uh, they say it was built here in 1946, it was built in 1945, uh, and it was built in the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, University of Pennsylvania was established by Ben Franklin. We talked about him a little bit earlier, but um, that's not really the, the, the point I want to go on because University of Pennsylvania is in Philadelphia and you, Mike, you're telling me that this on the Susquehanna, what are you talking about? Well, ENIAC, the first large-scale general purpose electronic digital computer is delivered to the U.S. Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory, which also, for those of you who are familiar with Edgewood Arsenal, this is the same place, the Aberdeen Proving Ground. They're like, you know, in the same general campus um, in 1947. So ENIAC, the first computer, the first general computer, which is the birthplace of the information age, which was made in the University of Pennsylvania by John von Neumann, John the, John the new man, you know, John, you, you know, if you know John von Neumann, you know, your, you know, you know, your, your mathematical history, but he was like, you know, he was who, who Einstein thought was the smartest guy in the room. Um, you know, he, this is where these guys worked and they built this, you know, this is also like right at the whole, uh, this was part of the Philadelphia experiment, same place, same period of time, same people. And this computer was built for the university or not for the university it was built for the U S army. So the birth of the information age is also the birth of the military industrial complex. There was a never a moment that computers and military were not in bed together. So just keep that in mind. So, okay. So all of that Aberdeen proving grounds, this is where it was 1947 it was 1945 is really when it began, but 47 is when ENIAC was finally delivered and it went up and running in Aberdeen. It was, it was up and running in Philadelphia beforehand, probably, you know, um, so anyway, so where is Aberdeen? So right here we have Susquehanna river. And this here is the Chesapeake Bay. This is where the transition happens. This right here is 95. And right here is Aberdeen Proving Grounds. So much rich stuff is going on right here. Um, I could spend an, every single one of these topics, I could go an hour into like the amount of supporting evidence, which just shows like just how, how strongly um, supported this I'm, this is an etheric pathway. We're seeing it physically, but it's an etheric pathway. But how strongly it supports that that concept. But Aberdeen Proving Grounds, this is where, where ENIAC was. So um, here's a little picture of it. <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a moment. Um, and on a synchromistic level... Uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about John D. I'm assuming that you're familiar with John D, at least by name, but John D with Edward Kelly is, um, you know, they are, uh, best known as delivering what's, what's known as the Enochian, the Enochian language, uh, Enochian magic. Um, and so John D is also the guy who, and we're going to cover this in a little bit, uh, He's the guy who um, trained all of the British navigators for where they should go and set up the colonies. And he was the guy who was behind the British, um, the, the, he, the father of the idea of a British empire. And so this is where the British empire happened and he was Enochian magic. And then here's the first computer and it is a phonetic match. <laughs> to the magic which which John D who was a magician you know which he was he is associated with this is very very synchromistic and I'll take it one level further so if you know your John D history so he worked with Edward Kelly and Edward Kelly was a scryer he stared he stared into an obsidian stone and that was how the communication happened and so um John D was more of like a ceremonial magician, like did all the ritual sort of stuff. And, but he did not have what was known as a magical mind and a magical mind is an imaginative mind. Um, and you need an imaginative mind to scry 
because scrying is kind of like seeing uh, shapes in the clouds. And so you're looking in and you're softening your eyes. And then it is through that mechanism that, you know, things come alive. It's kind of like really simplifying and rationalizing, if you will, scrying. I'm not saying scrying is an effective technique or not. I'm just saying like, in order to do it, practitioners who do it well, they have that ability. And John D did not. John D's mind, uh, and you know, you get this by by the biographies on John D. They always say his mind was wired as like a computer. He was too rational, and he did not have the ability to allow like all of the stuff necessary for scrying. So it just makes like perfect synchronistic sense that the first computer like kind of has this nod nod wink wink connection to john d and this is just the beginning we're going to touch it a little bit deeper and but the more you see it like the more you're like holy shite this is like friggin grounded so anyway let's uh let's move on to the next um fuck i'm 50 minutes into this i don't even think i'm halfway down um okay uh the first fruit of electrical distribution so what do we got right here the Hotel Edison in Sunbury, PA, was built in 17 or 1871, and it was the first building lit with Thomas Edison's three-wire system. It was done in 1883. So duh, 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 duh. here's the marker in Sunbury. If you could see closely, the first electrified first electrification project. Sunbury. Thomas Edison, he was an immensely successful businessman, and this was the place where he built his first um, electrical plant and then had the wiring brought to a building of the three-wire electrical distribution. Um, a lot to say about electricity right now, um, but particularly as it relates to electricity and, and this idea of like a Saturnian expression of the age of Aquarius. Um, there's a really interesting book, which is called uh, The Invisible Rainbow. And the author does a pretty, in, a pretty strong job showing how um, negatively impacting to the human, the collective human family, every time there's been a major change in the introduction of the electrification of the atmosphere, beginning right here, then going to like radar and like all the way up to like 5G. And, you know, and that doesn't mean that electricity is bad, but it's more so like how the electricity is done. So like, you know, uh, going back to this Aquarius and, and Saturnian expression, like Saturnian might be this three wild, three wired distribution of, of energy of electricity versus like some of the ideas of like maybe what Tesla had with like the wireless electricity, or maybe something more along fantastical of what we think of like Tataria, which had entire villages, architecture, we're tapping into scalar waves to release some sort of electric, you know, I say electricity, a different form of it into the population. But nonetheless, this is where the three wire distribution of electricity began at Sunbury, PA. I'm going to show you where that is in a moment, but I also want to point this out is Edison was a um, member of the Theosophical Society. He definitely was, had a spiritual bent to him. And we're going to come back to, to um, Theosophy throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. But let's go into Sunbury. So where are we? So look right here. This is the confluence of the rivers. This is where Sunbury is. This is exactly where, um, uh, where the Sunbury Hotel is. This is where, where Edison built it. A lot of very, very interesting things happen. Uh, native, uh, from a native perspective, like the significance of this area, to a historical perspective, to so many different reasons. But, you know, so deep here. But, you know, this is, this is where we have this altar. We've got, uh, we've got the birthplace of electricity, three wires right here, first computer, and then we've got globalism, Jamestown, all the way down here. But I said I also want to... Um, uh, we can go and look. So these, this, the, the, the first fruits they were, they were offered on this altar. That's what we have right here. And then there's this continuation of this, this altar being continued, um, to be fed with energy. Um, 
I called a four. Oh, there's so much information and <laughs> so little time um because i want to go into like why it's a 400 year altar uh, i'll go into that in a moment but before we get into that i want to show how it is being continually uh uh if you were infused with energy um So actually, I'm looking at my slides right now. That's not the next thing uh, we're going into. We're going into, um, this is a river altar to whom? So that that's a good question. So I'm going to go into the the other thing, which I said uh, in a couple slides. So who is this? Uh, if this is a river altar, okay, okay, this is, this is really good. So, okay, you've built an altar. I'm with you, Mike. This is an altar. Um, that makes a little bit of sense, but okay. Well, then, then who are they building it to? Who is the who is the deity to who this is? Um, who this is? Uh, uh, these first fruits are being offered to and given to. And I'm like, that is a great question. That is a great question to ask. Um, and who this to is? Uh, God, I want to spend like one hour just talking about this topic because it's so friggin' rich. But it is to. Um, the goddess Sequana. Remember, we talked a little bit about the Celtic river goddesses and, like, you know, the river and the uh, um, and the goddess which it was associated with. It they were one and the same. And the 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 people that followed um, that followed the 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 particular um, deity tied to a particular river. You know, they were named after the goddess. Watch the video, of the goddess Susquehanna. I go into that and I go into this next piece, which gets. Uh, well, these two pieces. So let me finish with this. So the word Susquehanna is of Algonquin origin. So this is um, this is part of our, our Wikipedia history. If you go and you find out where Susquehanna comes from, it said that it's a uh, um, an Algonquin word. Algonquin is um, it's a language family associated primarily with uh, the 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 people that lived in what we now think of as the northwest the northeast United States. Um, you know, at the time of, of the arrival of the British colonies, you know, 15, 1600s, they spoke of uh, different Algonquin dialects, the, the Iroquois, uh, the Confederate, the Confederate, Ir the Iroquois Confederacy. Yeah, that's it. The Iroquois Confederacy. Um, so uh, Susquehanna is an Algonquin origin name. And typically, like, you're going to get like this really kind of um, like a, 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 a simplistic definition like i think one of the definitions is like the the muddy river or something along those lines but we're going to get a little bit uh synchro mystic here um so if you go and you follow some of the work of barry fell i think his name is uh he was a a, a linguist a harvard linguist in um the 70s and 80s he wrote extensively linking together the algonquin language and gaelic um the the language which was spoken by the uh the celtic culture and he he makes a very strong argument saying like there were celtic people living in north america for a long long time and we can see it like in the similarity of words and where he bases a lot of his um, conclusions is primarily with rivers. Like there are the names of a lot of these these rivers, which we find in the Northeast, are phonetically very, very similar to um, to Gaelic words, and they have the same um, the same uh, meaning, both in Gaelic or similar meanings, both in the Gaelic and the Algonquin uh, tongue. But we're going to go a little bit deeper because. Uh, you know, Ga Gaelic, the Celtic people, we think about their religion or their priest class, the Druids. You know, all of this is, this is so deep. This is why we need so much time to talk about it because it, it connects so deeply and we need to, we need to have a basis of understanding. So, uh, <laughs> if you see frustration on my face, it's like, I want to be able to be uh, concise with these, with these videos, but they're so deep. So anyway, so, um, we talked a little bit about uh, the 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 other um, holy rivers within the the Celtic um, culture, and one of the most significant was a river called Sequana. So now we got the Susquehanna, we've got Sequana. Um, 
we're not even going to talk about like the similarities where uh, in words and like you know analyzing that like you you could do that in your own sort of interpretation thinking about it but let's go down and look at Sequana. Sequana is the ancient name of the River Seine. So the River Seine is what Paris is on. It is uh, before it was called France, it was called Gaul, and it was a Celtic culture that lived there. And the people that um, that that uh, followed uh, the goddess Sequana, which they bathed in her healing waters, they were called the Sequani. Um, we're going to get into that in a little bit later. Um, but what do we have right here? So um, the goddess of the river Sen, she was known as Sequana, uh, particularly at the springs at the source of the Sen. Um, her name means flat, fast flowing one. So that's where they're telling what uh, the, the, the Gaelic word for um, Sequana is. But the point I want to I wanna make is here is that there's something very significant at the springs of the Sequana um, because we're going to touch up against that or the springs of the Sen which is the source location of it. Um, let me see if there's anything else interesting in here. Uh, this river goddess uh, uh, what does it say? As in many other cases, to be a river goddess meant that you were strongly connected to a role as a healer. This is because uh, her at the source location, this was a very, very um, well-used uh, healing um, pilgrimage location. People traveled from all over to heal in their waters. We know this from the archaeological um, from the archaeological. Uh, history record so okay so why does all this matter because there is this correlation and this is what i go uh, we go into a lot in the goddess susquehanna between the sun the sen river and sequana and susquehanna and river goddess worship and there is a lot of evidence it's it's it i've not found consistent um analysis of the river goddesses within celtic lore so it's what i'm about to say is not consistently said um but i go into this in that video Video I made reference to, but it's also said that Sequana, when she was in um, when she was in France before she was renamed in North America, if you will, and we'll get to that in a moment. She was the the highest ranking, on the top of the pyramid, if you will, of earth river goddesses. So of all of the, the, the significant river goddesses within the Celtic religion, Sequana was the peak of it. I've read um, other analysis or other analysis of Celtic culture, which doesn't say that. But I do know that that is part that is within the historical record because, God, I don't want to go down this path, but the reason why this river altar is where it is is because of the significance of what Sequana as a river goddess, whatever that may be, whether that's metaphorical, whether that's literal, whether it's, I don't know, but that seems to be a very, very significant reason why we're seeing these first fruits upon this river. This river that we've already established is a, um, just physiologically is unique amongst the millions of rivers on the planet. So, okay, so here I want to get into some of like the, just some of the, the more strange, um, the more strange uh, synchro mystic stuff. So what do we say? So we said Sequana, the goddess of the river Sw um, Sen, um, particularly the springs at the source of the Sen. Um, that's where, as I said, the, the, the healing location is. So we can see in January 2009 that the source location, what was used to be known um, in France, known as the Source Seine, um, it joined up with the town next to it and they changed the name. They changed the name from Source Seine to Saint Germain Source Seine because I guess Saint Germain was uh, a, a, a commune, a hamlet, which was uh, adjacent to it. Now it's got the same name. So why is that kind of interesting? So within theosophy, within the theosophical perspective, and we're going to talk about theosophy a little bit more, um, uh, Saint Germain is really significant. And Saint Germain is said to be responsible 
for ushering in the new age culture of the age of Aquarius. Remember, all this is about ushering in an expression of the age of Aquarius. And now we're going to go one step further. You know, there is, there is, you know, ideas. I don't know if this is true or not. I know that Francis Bacon, his name and his history is tied to the most significant influencers on our culture. So I know he's important. I don't know what he is. You know, part of me is like, if this is a simulation, that's the name of the OS upgrade, Francis Bacon. But regardless, you know, Francis Bacon's a really big guy, uh, Secret in Susquehanna, we go into that really deeply. I'm going to hit upon it in a little bit, hopefully sooner than later. But we also know that within theosophical perspective, there is a line of thought which says that Saint Germain, you know, the guy who ushers in the age of Aquarius, is also Francis Bacon. So Francis Bacon is Saint Germain. Saint Germain is the usher in of the age of Aquarius. And we see the source of the Sen, the source of the Sequana, the ancient Sequana is... Um, you know, it's tying into the same names, the same people, the same organizations, the same symbology on a certain level, on a, on a certain synchro mystic level, on a higher level, a deeper level, whatever word you want to use, on a greater level than our 3D rational linear thinking. This is like linked up. So now let me go one step further. All right. So remember, if you remember this map from earlier this is Haverty Grace this Susquehanna River this is where or I'm sorry that's Haverty Grace this is Aberdeen Proving Grounds right here this is Chesapeake Bay this is where the first computer is this is where Eniac is and right here literally at the city that um that uh um sits on the actual transition where the river turns into the bay like this is probably like three four miles away is a um is a town in maryland called haverty grace it's sit, it's situated at the mouth of the susquehanna river at the head of the chesapeake bay and it is named for the port city la havre i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly france so now, hopefully we can see this map. We can see Le Havre right there. And we can see this is the Seine. And this is where the Seine empties out into the English Channel. Into, you know, basically the ocean. So we see at, at these transitions, you know, we have the same river, which kind of has the same name, Seine, but it's Sequana and Susquehanna. And then we see that we have the same, like, you know, slightly different, but very, very similar, and they're linked because we know that Haverty Grace is named for it. So we've got that there. So again, this is just like the, the scratching of the surface, and the deeper and the deeper and the deeper we go, we see more like how strong it is. Um, there is so much connected with the Susquehanna and the Seine. Um, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite avenues of the Susquehanna River, but um, now is not the time or the place. So, all right, so um, now we're going to go into how this energy is being fused into this river. So, okay, imagine this is a river. It is, um, this, this magical working was placed upon it. I'm suggesting that it begins with our boy, Dr. D, because Dr. D was a magician. He trained all of these different, um, we're going to go into D a little bit, but he started this. This is, you know, this is the British Empire. He dreamed up the British Empire. He trained the uh, navigators. You know, I have no proof, but my sense is this is where they always wanted to go. However he got his information, who knows, but this is where they wanted to go. So, um, this is a magical altar, magical working, and it's being infused with energy uh, at the endpoints every year at major um, at major points on the wheel. So, what's the wheel? The wheel is the ancient holiday calendar, the calendar the Celts used, and so um, this is uh, and. It just makes so much sense. Like if you want to think about like in terms of like when would be a holy day and what would be, you know, objective ways of, of really defining a holy day what would be like the, the day with the most amount of sunlight, the day with the least amount of sunlight, the day was with equal amounts of sunlights. You know, this is the, this is the um, solstice, solstice, equinox, equinox, and then the midpoints between the two. Um, 
And that's what we have here. And these are like the, the eight festivals, the eight, um, the eight uh, holidays, holy days of the ancient world. And what we're seeing are major, major secular um, events that occur on each of these points that correspond generally. You know, it doesn't all, it's not always a, a, a bullseye, but it's definitely always close. In some years, it's definite bullseyes that happen on these, these key points. So right here, this is, where I, I, this is Cooperstown, remember? Baseball Hall of Fame. What's the highlight of the Baseball Hall of Fame? Their annual induction weekend. That's when they, they do their ritual, their ceremony. The entire town of Cooperstown is filled with spectators, 70,000 people. And when does this happen? This happens usually the first weekend, the last weekend in July or the first weekend in in August, which corresponds very closely to August 1st. And what is August 1st? August 1st is when we have, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Like another word for it is Lamas. Um, but that is a key point right here. And you know, if you're familiar with, with these traditions or these practices, you know, uh, the, the, um, the purpose of this part of the, the annual cycle kind of tells you like where the energy, which is being infused into the river. But so we've, we've got, we've got, uh, the baseball hall of fame induction ritual happening right here. Um, so here, uh, let me move this. This location of the Baseball Hall of Fame. This is a lake, um, Lake Atswago, I think it's called. This is where it empties or where it becomes the, the Susquehanna River. You could see how close they are. This is like two blocks away. This also is a very significant meeting place of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the Iroquois Nation. It's called Council Rock, or at least that's what's called now. Like this was always recognized as being significant and, um, and uh, having an importance to it. Uh, also located right here, you're going to find this plaque. It's from the village, the village of Cooperstown and says, this marker signifies where the beautiful Susquehanna River begins its 444 mile journey to meet the Chesapeake Bay. So all you number lovers out there who like, you know, the triple numbers, you know, uh, you got that. And so when you go and you look at the Sen or the Sequana, we've got, you know, we've got another triple number. This time in kilometers, you know, at the Sen is 777 miles. You know, I'm not... I'm not saying one, those are accurate numbers of how long they are. And I'm not saying this was done for any sort of like uh, mystical way, but, you know, it's, it's, they're there. And those numbers are tied to these two rivers. So, all right, let me go a little bit deeper. Uh, baseball, God, I could spend so much time on baseball, but baseball is an esoteric ritual. That's not me saying, that's this Hannah Shapiro in her video she did here in this, this essay, The Masonic Ritual of Baseball by Pilgrim. Um, but what I will say is um, baseball's relationship to Cooperstown, well, that's very, very theosophical. Remember, we keep on talking about theosophy. So the, uh, the Theosophical Society founded by H.P. Blavatsky. So now we've got these uh, two, here are two, two um, prominent members during different time periods of the Theosophical Society, Abner Doubleday and Albert Spalding. So Albert Spalding was the was was one of the owners of the Chicago Cubs, and he was tasked to get to the originator of baseball, who discovered baseball. Um, he was uh, that was his job by um, you know uh, the owners' association of the major baseball teams, and his conclusion was that Abner Doubleday invented that in Cooperstown. It's the only reason why the Baseball Hall of Fame is here. It's known within baseball circles as the double day myth because when you start to go and look at Albert Spalding's analysis, there's no way that Abner Doubleday invented baseball um, here at Cooperstown. But nonetheless, that, that, uh, that kind of stuck with it and this is where the Baseball Hall of Fame was established. So what is true is that Albert Spalding was a follower of H.P. Blavatsky's theos or a member of her society and a follower of her teachings. Um, this was probably what, like maybe like 50 years after the founding. I'm not certain what the time frame. Eh, probably not even that far, maybe like 30 or 40. But anyway, Spalding mentioned Doubleday. 
Double Day is the he was known best in American history because he was the hero of uh, maybe even the unsung hero of the Battle of Gettysburg. And um, again, we could spend so much time about Gettysburg, but all I'm going to say is he is the symbol of 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 the North winning Gettysburg, if you will. And you know that's one of the reasons why some people think that that Albert Spalding selected Doubleday because it was like good PR, if you will. He had a very positive kind of uh, image within the collective consciousness, and all of this was just kind of like a PR stunt anyway. But the truth of the matter is, when H. P. Blavatsky stepped down as the president of the Theosophical Society in the United States, and she returned to India, there was a replacement for her as president. And guess who that president was? Abner Doubleday. So we got this Theosophical member, and we know this because of the amount of money which he uh, donated to the Theosophical Society. Uh, he then picked this former president of the Theosophical Society and said, yeah, this is where the guy invented it. So we've got that connection. And then Stephen Clark, who was the, the guy who actually built and established the Baseball Hall of Fame, he's from a very, very um, esoteric and, and elite American family behind the Singer sewing machine <coughs> manufacturing um, family. And we, I did a video of, of baseball's connection where I go into it. It's so interesting. But anyway, one I could not find anything like which would really, really strongly connect um, Clark to to Theosophy. But what we do know is that Clark was very, very instrumental in making um, modern art, the movement of modern art, become a a mainstream sort of. Uh, um, occurrence and we know that because he played a very significant role in on the board of um the metropolitan museum of um of art or no the modern uh the met he was involved with the met but also the um the modern well, i can't even think of what the museum is the uh is a, whatever the modern art museum from in new york city is he was a major player in that and that's really how modern art was introduced to um, a wider basis. But if you go to the history of modern art, you're going to see that its roots are theosophical, or at least its founder always expressed that uh, modern art was a visual ex expression of theosophical principles. So we've got baseball there. Uh, we've got like this really, really kind of... Um, uh, interesting some hidden some like you know uh, uh implied connection to theosophy just like we saw with with uh um with with edison so now let's go on to um let's go on to point b what's going on here in the middle of pennsylvania and so a is a direct bullseye on one level it's a direct bullseye um, uh, physically, it is uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame is literally two blocks away from the source location of the North Branch. On the West Branch, it's a little bit, uh, it doesn't, the, the river doesn't begin in such an obvious and dramatic setting as leaving a, a, a lake, a very large lake. It's a bunch of maybe different springs and it's arguable where the actual beginning of the West Branch is. But in the general area, probably within like, five, ten miles of where the different springs that begin this, this western branch of the Susquehanna is where we find Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. And so where Puxatawney may not be a bullseye as it relates to its physical location. It's very, very close, but it's not a bullseye. It's a bullseye in its date because this always has to happen on a weekend. But what happens in Puxatawney always happens on February 2nd, on Imbolc, directly opposite on the wheel from Lamas. And what is it that happens there? Groundhog's Day, always on, Pem on February 2nd. Now, obviously, Groundhog's Day is recognized and celebrated um, much greater than Pennsylvania, but the Puxatawney Groundhog's Day celebration is recognized as the... Uh, premier primary like major groundhog day celebration 
Uh, this is the Bill the Bill Murray movie is all about the Puxatawney, um, the Puxatawney uh, Groundhog's Day celebration, and it's always on the second. And you go and you look at these guys. So here we go. These are the the Puxatawney Phil guys. There's a group that um, puts on and manages this event, which now has worldwide following. And if you go and you look, these are all Masons. These are Freemasons. Look at the look at the outfit. You know, this is not by any stretch an official Masonic organization. But by the way they dress, certainly looks like it. So um, let's go on to the third point. The third thing that happens uh, right down here at the bottom is the Norfolk NATO Festival. So NATO which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and it's this kind of like military um, uh, 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 treaty between Europe and, and, and the United States and, you know, agreeing that we have each other's back. And this was like after World War II and, and had like a whole lot of Cold War type of implications. So Norfolk has like three, or NATO has three main locations. Their main location, which is in Brussels, I believe. And then they have this Norfolk at the Norfolk Naval Base, which is right here. And then there's one in San Diego as well. But the Nor uh, Norfolk NATO Festival happens every year at um, the last weekend of April or the first weekend of May, May 1st, May Day. So now we have Beltane. So now we have like our third, our third event. And this is a pretty big event. You know, it's, it's uh, um, uh, folks who live in the Norfolk area, you know, it's, it, they're going to come to see this. Uh, and we, we see with the date, you know, obviously it, it ties into it, but then also Norfolk, you know, one or NATO, it, it certainly has like certain, um, you know, globalist implications, like when you're, when you're thinking about uh, what NATO is, but then also, um, I always like to throw this out here, um, NATO's law symbol, the, this article, it's talking about it and it says NATO, which is known as Oltan in French, is very, very similar to Wotan, you know, another way of expressing Odin. And now we're going into a little bit more of this kind of like Celtic pagan type of, of understanding of, you know, of ritual and, 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 uh, um, you know, expression of life. So, okay. Uh, I hinted at the the four hundred year um, the four hundred year altar. So let me go and show where this comes in. Um, this is all the secret of Susquehanna. This is it, our just to itself. But I'm going to boil down to it. So Jamestown begins uh, in 1607, and this historical document, this map, is a big connection to Jamestown. And um, watch the video. It's so fascinating. But on this map, this is the Chesapeake Bay right here. We see this reverse 40, this mirrored 40. Um, and, you know, I go all into it in the Susquehanna, the sequel in the Susquehanna, but the nuts and the bolts of it is, is that hidden within this map, which connects directly to Francis Bacon. Historically, this is connects to Francis Bacon, same St. Germain, same guy we're talking about, who's known for his ciphers. He put in a cipher in here, or actually like steganography is more accurate. Um, and it's a secret location and it's the 40th parallel at the Susquehanna River. And so um, I'm not going to go into the logic for why that's the conclusion, but it's, it's, you know, it's based upon some real like, yeah, it makes sense for why that would be the conclusion. So then you go and you look at uh, um, real reality and you go look at that location, the 40th parallel in the Susquehanna River. So let me go show you where that is. Um, This dotted line is the 40th parallel. You know, this is Philadelphia. It's on the 40th parallel. Every state that goes through, that the 40th parallel goes through, you'll see the state capital is plus or minus like 20 miles uh, from this line. A lot of states, that's exactly where, um, is exactly where the capital is. This is where um, Harrisburg is right here. Three mile islands here. But anyway, this is the 40th parallel. If you go and you look there in, um, in, 
in material reality and you look exactly at 40 degrees zero minutes and six seconds so that's like on that invisible line like this is just 600 feet from it and this is a google earth shot of high point hp hp blavatsky um high point scenic vista a public park which is a quarter mile from the river's bank you can't really see it here but you'll see it in the video and from this bird's eye google earth view you can see this is you take this path up and this is on the top of a hill it's the high point you've got these great vistas and you can see these um blocks these are granite uh benches to sit at to take in the vista and then right here is a compass a uh, compass rose and then you would never know this if you were there but from looking from above you can see that it's in this shape of a crescent moon and sun you know this ancient alchemical symbol we find it right there and when did this high point park open it opened on march 12 2007 when did Jamestown, when was, it, when was it established? On May 14th, 1607, literally 400 years to the day. In fact, on the same weekend this opened, May 12th, 2007, May 12th, 2007 at Jamestown, there was like a major historical celebration where Queen Elizabeth arrives into it. I mean, that in itself, this is what we go into the video, but we can see this, why I say it's a 400 year magical ritual. Um, you know, within uh, within the Kabbalah, within uh, gematria, a uh, Hebrew gematria in particular, uh, the final lev letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav, has a value of 400. 400 represents the completion of a cycle, you know, and, and Queen Elizabeth, Rosicrucians, they are all Kabbalists. So this is their system. And so when we see this at 400 years, you know, to the day, that's why I say it's a 400 year magical ritual. And the magical ritual, in my opinion, it began right here on the establishment of Jamestown. I mean, and I don't even go on the dates here, but it concludes right here at this sacred location. This is the sacred location, the 40th parallel, and a lot, a lot of really, really um, significant stuff happens right there on the river, but we're not going to go into it here because this is about understanding it as an altar. And this is where this 400 year, this completion cycle, beginning with the British Empire, the beginning, the first fruits of, of globalism, the first fruits of, of computer technology, the first fruits of, of three wire distribution of electricity and, um, which are all expressions of a Saturnian viewpoint of the age of Aquarius. So, all right, I'm 90 minutes into this. Uh, I definitely want to get into John D just a little bit because that's where this all begins. You're like, okay, magical altar. Um, we got to look at John D because, you know, as I said, this is where it starts. John D was the 16th century real life Gandalf. You know, here are pictures of him. Uh, I'm assuming that you know a, a little bit about, about this if you're watching this video. Um, there's a lot of stuff about John Dee. I think I've talk, I talk about him a lot. Um, but it's important to recognize his role in uh, this entire um, in this entire kind of uh, narrative. So I'm taking like the follow the following stuff from the John D Society. You can go and find uh, this on the John D website or their website if you just search for it. Uh, our primary purpose is to produce a standard edition of the published and unpublished works of the Elizabethan England's greatest polymath, antiquarian, and magus. Dr. John D to make available to students of the Renaissance philosophy and D's Enochian magical system a coherent database of the primary source material for his, uh, for his stuff. Uh, you know, these guys are like the real deal as it relates to John D. We could see visionary of the British Empire. First to apply Euclid geometry to navigation, trained the great navigators. Who was he training? He was training the British navigators to go start the British Empire. Uh, so this is what's interesting. So with Kelly, they used an obsidian showstone, which came from the Aztecs. This is what they scried in, which I was talking to earlier. So we see there's a connection to um, 
to uh, uh, to the the Mayan calendar, the Aztec calendar. So um, just through that John D. Aztec um, uh, uh, obsidian stone, which he used to find out about um, Enochian magic. Or again, you know, that's that's a story which we're told. Um, so. You know, John D. also um, the original 007. We say that because this is how he signed his name, his his letters to Queen Elizabeth, because he was her spy. He would go to other other uh, um, other royal courts, and he would communicate with her through letters. And he would write, maybe you know, maybe in code, maybe not, but he would always sign his letters uh, with this insignia and for your eyes only. You know, we say 007, but uh, there's a whole other school of thought that this is uh, uh, two balls and a cane, tubular cane, you know, a very, very symbolic within Freemasonry. And arguably, this is uh, the, the symbol of, of, of Facebook. You know, there's a lot of interesting analysis between the Facebook symbol and, and this. But this is John D. This is where we connect to, to state spycraft, CIA, you know, all of that stuff. It... Um, it comes from easy, easy. I don't see why she's growling, but apparently she doesn't like me talking about the CIA <laughs> and John D. Um, Nokian magic, you know, uh, who who is known as is the uh, greatest. Um, the greatest uh, user and most skilled Enochian magician, Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley, who's the guy, he's um, the one who's had the most, uh, an incredibly profound influence on modern culture. You know, we're seeing where all of this is like kind of like spilling out. Um, so what I wanted to point out, the final thing with John D goes back to this whole thing with Enoch. You know, he's Enochian magic. And we also want to bring, um, if Enoch is the first computer, and it has this John D connection, uh, the first quantum computer, at least the first quantum computer we're told, is, called, is by a company known as D-Wave. You know, like John D waving. And these are both dedicated, uh, actually... Uh, Enoch is dedicated, and then D-Waves is demonstrated basically on the same day, February 15th and February 13th. Let's see. We can see that right there. And these are ancient holidays. Ancient fertility holidays happen on the 15th, on Lupercalius, or Lupercalia, excuse me. So we're beginning to, to see this ritualistic level is so, so deep. And so um, I'm going to wrap up with the, uh, with, with, the, with the D wave because I just find it so interesting. Um, because John D, as we saw before, uh, I didn't even go and talk about his connection to Francis Bacon. But Francis Bacon um, was... The supposed, you know, because they don't have official documents saying, but like, you know, all evidence points to Francis Bacon being the head of the Rosicrucian order. And we see at least as, as, as it's described from the John D. Society, he's the founder of the Rosicrucian order. There is a decent amount of evidence that suggests these guys are a continuation of the same path, at the very least, um, John D. being the the visionary of the British Empire, and then Francis Bacon being the guy who actually um, was the operations manager of the establishment of the British Empire, because you know he was the executive director of the company behind Jamestown, Virginia Company of London. So we see this connection, and then we also see this like really, really strange. Uh, synchro mystic connection. This is part of like, you know, I, I keep saying the mystery because like, you know, it's just pointing to it. We don't fully understand exactly everything that's connected. But when you go and you look at D-Wave, the quantum compu computing company, its founder was Gordy Rosicrucian, <laughs> you know, who speaks of the aliens and artificial te intelligence and summoning entities. And if you know your, your, your Nokian magic, that's what this seems to be about. 
And now we want to go and look at this kind of like juxtaposition of the D-Wave computer next to this, this ENIAC and just, you know, the, the strange similarity. So, uh, God, I'm 90 minutes into this right now. And um, this is a, a time for me to, to wrap this up. I really want to go in deeper with the Enochian magic and how it ties into the river altar because, you know, I've been kind of like all over the place right now, but I can't help it. Like this topic is so exciting for me, like to be able to share it. So so I go all over the place, but there's a strong correlation. But I want to I wanna go in and, and like maybe like bring it all back. Um, this 400 year period of this river altar from 1607 to 2007 it's overlapping um almost perfectly with what's called the the 13th baktun and if you remember in the previous video we talked about the mayan calendar we talked about the different baktuns and within um uh this 1320 uh Sulkin, the I'll take a step back within within the 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 Mayan calendar uh the main count is a 260 day count it's called the Tzolkin um and the reason why that's thought of as being a very human ana uh, ratio is because the human being has 13 primary joints ankles knees hips shoulders elbows wrists and knee and then 20 digits and um, 13 times 20 is 260, so that's their count. But within the 13 aspect, and that ties to the lunar phase, the 13th, um, the 13th count uh, is not like the culmination of the wave. It is uh, like it's not the peak. The peak is right in the middle, like number seven. 13 is the preparation for the next one. And so when we see this 13th Bakhtun during this 400 year, that overlaps almost perfectly with this 400 year period, this 400 year period began with, with, you know, at least from the mine with the guy who was working with the scryer, who was staring into the Aztec obsidian um, stone, which I think is probably, you know, a fair assumption belonged to some high, uh, a priest, you know, and it was probably passed on <coughs> for a very long time. We see this overlap, and it was during this overlap period, which, you know, not only is the the conclusion, the thirteenth baktun, the thirteenth within the 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 cycle, the the settling of that phase, but it's also on more of the undercurrent. And that undercurrent is what I'm going to say is synchromistic. That undercurrent is where you have the secret societies. That undercurrent is Rosicrucian orders. That is where we see the preparation for the next stage. And that's what this is. And that's what we've seen done on this river goddess, Sequana. This great, this the most ancient river. The highest of Celtic goddesses. The the real ruler of, of, of you know, from this, this kind of tutelatory spirit. Um, spirit perspective um, that's why it was done here and that's what the first fruits were to and if you really read about your Enochian magics Enochian magic is about controlling tutelatory spirits and it is a way of by putting the first fruits upon the river with this Enochian magic and you know, I don't know if there were Enochian ceremonies but what I know is the guy who brought in Enochian magic is the guy who who dreamed up this whole thing and this Saturn and it's all about the age of Aquarius and we're seeing an expression of the new man you know John von Neumann coming in front of us at this exact moment and it's with that <laughs> you know if you want to learn more about it um you know here's the hundred year transition first computer singularity slides up uh in a um a phi ratio by the way with this um 400 year cycle i'm gonna leave that that picture right here um i mean it's 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 good spellcraft. What I mean by that, it was really well designed because all of this is laid down in, in phi ratio, golden ratio, all this sort of stuff. Um, 
and it's for a certain expression and you know uh that's what i want to really talk about in in the next video um and i'm going to talk about different expressions i'm going to talk about you know ways of embodying saturn expression versus aquarius pers perspective per, um expression and then how this can link to this river and how um part of part of the way of navigating this scenario this this the scenario which we're finding ourselves is by working at a higher level and i want to talk about that in the uh in the the third video and so that's going to be um you know a lot of this stuff kind of these videos um resonate with a more conspiratorial kind of perspective but we're going to get into the uh um we're going to get more into the metaphysics in the next one so um be forewarned and here's the last slide so i always like to end with this whenever i talk about dr john d so there's always more to meet the eye. This is a painting of John Dee performing an experiment before Elizabeth I. It was done in 1913. This is John Dee, and that's Queen Elizabeth, and he's doing magic right here. And they are uh, doing some sort of like uh, fancy art x-rays. They looked at what was um, like a couple layers deeper within this painting, and what we found was that there's a ring of skulls that there's a nut that the the pre painted over you know what you see right here this floor and this you know it's not exactly a masonic checkerboard floor but um there's also a, a ring of skulls so there is um there's always more than meets the eye uh this is mike <laughs> uh signing off thanking for thanking you guys for hanging in with me on this uh uh one hour and 40 minute uh presentation hope to see you in the third part